Okay, hello everybody. I'm honored and thrilled to have uh, to present to you uh, the speaker for uh, the next installment for this installment of Merle seminar series. We have with us uh, Melanie Mitchell, uh, who is a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, she's uh, of course well known in this field of AI and complex systems, uh, and also more recently because of her uh, research into large language models and uh, thoughtful, very careful and thoughtful opinions on these recent advances in AI. Uh, her research focus is on conceptual abstraction and analogy making in uh, AI systems. Uh, and one of the earlier uh, and successful computer programs for analogy making was written by her, uh, along with her PhD advisor, and it's called Copycat. And I encourage people to look into that. It's very interesting. And it can do, uh, you know, in some sense, a human like analogy making in this micro world of a short string. Um, and that's how I got to know about her work more, and uh, we're very happy that she is here today. Um, so Melanie is the author of an editor of six books and numerous scholarly papers in the fields of AI, cognitive science, and complex systems. Um, uh, two of her main books are like complex about one about complexity, a guided tour, which won the 2010 Phi Beta Kappa Science Book Award, and also her 2019 book on called Artificial Intelligence: A Guide for thinking humans uh, has been shortlisted for the 2023 uh, Cosmos Prize of Scientific Writing. Uh, let us welcome Melanie to Merle and uh, over to you. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'll share my slides now and assume you can see all that. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, I'm just gonna minimize all this. Uh, great. So I'm going to be talking about a debate that's been going on in the AI community over large language models, to what extent they are intelligent, and even uh, more debatable, to what extent do they understand the data that they process. And this is uh, this talk is based on a paper I wrote with my colleague David Krakauer um, um, that was published last year in uh, PNAS. So this is the question, do AI systems understand the data that they process? And why does it matter if they don't understand the, the human world? Will they be able to interact with us effectively in that world? Well, we've seen in the past a number of failures of understanding in, for instance, deep learning systems. This paper back in 2018, uh, showed that a uh, deep neural network that had been trained on the ImageNet uh, data set was very good at object recognition of objects like school bus. Here it is recognizing this as a school bus with 100% confidence. But if that uh, object was um, put in some kind of what they called strange pose, some kind of rotation, some kind of unconventional um, view, the same neural network was 99% confident it was a garbage truck, or here a punching bag, or here a snowplow. And this, you know, somehow the system had learned to recognize objects in sort of a canonical view, like the ones that it had seen in its training data, but was unable to generalize in the way that humans can outside of uh, the the normal kinds of views in the training data. And this can, of course, have um, implications for real world trustworthiness of computer vision systems. You know, we've seen, for example, cars using self driving software crashing into stopped vehicles on freeways and not being reliable in identifying sort of the uh, possible obstacles that they might run into if they're too far outside what they've seen in their training data. These systems have also been shown to be vulnerable to what are called adversarial attacks. This is just one example where a few specially positioned stickers on a stop sign was shown to fool a neural network vision system into thinking this is a speed limit 80 sign in many different angles and distances from the camera. So 
the systems tended to be very good on uh, uh, data that was close to what they'd seen in their training data, but they were brittle to changes and particularly brittle to adversarial attacks on their data. They also uh, seem to have some problems with context. So for instance, here we have a self-driving car vision system correctly uh, identifying all the objects in the image, except it's not unable to, to decipher these images as actually parts of an ad for e-bikes as opposed to real objects in the real world. So this is something that's, you know, maybe a subtle edge case in um, a, what, a, what a self-driving car might see, but again, uh, quite um, likely to happen in some cases when these systems are deployed uh, broadly. Another example of this kind of edge case was um, pointed out by this uh, Twitter user who, who posted that his Tesla that he was using autopilot on kept slamming on the brakes in this area with no stop sign. And he didn't know what was causing it until he noticed this billboard, which had this uh, police officer with a stop sign as some kind of ad that the car was interpreting as a real stop sign. So this kind of context dependence of objects in the real world seems to be difficult to train these deep learning systems to understand. Um, deep learning systems you know, have shown extremely good performance on many sort of medical diagnostic tests, but they are also susceptible to what are called shortcuts. So here in this paper, these people reported that they trained a deep neural network to recognize skin cancer in these kinds of images. Um, but when they first trained the system and tried to figure out what it was paying attention to, they found that uh, it was using the presence of a ruler in the image to decide that there is skin cancer because of course the images with skin cancer were more likely to contain rulers. So the systems will learn whatever features they can that will give them some kind of statistical association with the correct answer. Um, and we've seen in many cases, these kinds of shortcuts are having the systems learn features that really aren't the ones that we humans want them to learn. They're not understanding in a human-like sense the context of what they're trying to learn. We Even in uh, language systems, uh, for instance, Google, Google Translate, even just a few weeks ago, I tried this, uh, this sentence, the legislator accidentally left a copy of the important bill he was writing in the taxi, and it translated bill into French as uh, facture, which is not the sense of bill, a legislative bill, but uh, a kind of bill that you would get from, say, a plumber or something like that. So it's not understanding the context of this uh, word that can have several meanings. And in fact, in the real world, it's AI systems like Google Translate have been shown to make mistakes that actually have, in fact, endangered asylum cases in Afghanistan by mistranslating people's uh, documents. But now we're really in a new era of AI. We're in the era of generative AI. <clears throat> and many people have argued that these systems have a new kind of understanding of the data that they uh, process. So for instance, have large language models achieved a richer human-like understanding than these previous AI systems I talked about? So if I asked ChatGPT to translate that same sentence into French, it translates the bill correctly. Uh, this is a, the um, kind of legislative bill. And I can even query it. I can say, how did you know how to translate that word? And it can tell me, you know, it's kind of verbose, but it says, you know, based on the context of the sentence, which mentions a legislator and a document, it's clear that the word bill refers to a legal document, et cetera. So it really does seem to understand the sentence in a way that, say, Google Translate does not. I can also ask, you know, ChatGPT all kinds of different reasoning tasks, like this little math word problem and it gets the right answer. Um, 
and I can ask it to explain its reasoning and it does so, you know, it, it's telling me exactly the correct way of reasoning about that uh, question. And I can even ask it to, you know, now draw pictures of real world uh, kinds of scenes like this fruit bowl or a line drawing of a bubble tea, you know, and I'm sure many of you have played with these systems and have been like me really impressed by their um, breadth of uh, knowledge and their seeming understanding of the world. Terry Sanofsky, one of the pioneers of deep learning or you know neural networks in general, <clears throat> wrote this article recently where he said, you know, a threshold was reached as if a space alien suddenly appeared that could communicate with us in an eerily human way. And he said, some aspects of their behavior appear to be intelligent, but if it's not human intelligence, what is the nature of their intelligence? And this is really the question that we in the AI world are grappling with. To what extent is this like human intelligence? To what extent can we trust these systems to understand us and our world in a trustworthy way? And many people have really made very um, ambitious claims about these systems, like that they're getting becoming sort of conscious, that scale is all you need, possibly even for general intelligence, that um, we're having a sense of optimism, that we're starting to see the emergence of systems with a degree of general intelligence, and maybe even more bluntly, this recent article, AGI, is already here. So this is one side of the debate that's saying we have really achieved this kind of <clears throat> understanding and general intelligence that um, AI has been striving for for so long. But there's another side to the debate, another extreme side, which says, no, these systems are autocomplete on steroids. They um, aren't intelligent. Intelligence and agency are the wrong categories for understanding them. Alison Gopnik argues that they're more like um, databases or libraries. And Jake Browning and Jan LeCun wrote that a system trained on language alone will never approximate human intelligence, even if trained from now until the heat death of the universe. So kind of the other extreme <clears throat> of this debate. And if you ask natural language processing researchers, um, this was from a 2022 survey, you ask them, you know, do they agree or disagree that generative models trained on text, given enough data and resources could understand natural language in some non-trivial sense? The result was basically exactly down the middle. About half of the people agreed and the other half disagreed and same about the same strongly disagreed and strongly agreed. So really there's quite a bit of disagreement <laughs> among people about where we stand with um, understanding or intelligence in these systems. And I wrote a column about this recently uh, for science that talked about how to evaluate these systems in some more um, holistic and uh, reliable way. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So how do we <clears throat> evaluate understanding in these systems? Well, one way is to just look at their behavior, you know, kind of chat with them, if you like, give them a kind of a Turing test. But the problem, of course, there is this is subject to what's called the ELISA effect. That is, you know, a reference to the original ELISA chatbot back in the 60s that people attributed intelligence and understanding to. So people are quite prone to attribute understanding to a, a system that can converse with them in some natural seeming way. Well, a more um, objective way <clears throat> to evaluate them is to test them on natural language understanding benchmarks. And we've seen a lot of that, but it, it, we have to um, be careful because these benchmarks sometimes allow the kinds of shortcuts that I talked about before, where these systems learn sort of statistical correlations among features and the correct uh, response or answer, but those um, 
shortcuts are only um, allowing sort of a shallow kind of statistical correlation, not more rich human-like understanding. So just as an example, a famous natural language understanding benchmark is the general language understanding evaluation or GLUE and its successor called SuperGLUE, which is a, a collection of natural language understanding tests. And you can see here, this was the leaderboard sometime recently um, of the scores, the best performance, and the top seven were uh, large language models. Number eight is humans. <laughs> but does this mean that large language models are surpassing humans on general language understanding. Well, in spite of the name of this benchmark, it turns out there's numerous shortcuts that many people have um, identified. Some people call it annotation artifacts. Um, another um, paper called it clever hands predictors. Uh, so that's a reference to this clever Hans, which was a horse back in the 19, early 1900s, who supposedly could do mathematics. People would ask it questions and it would tap out its hoofs to give the right answer to the arithmetic questions. But it turned out after a lot of study that um, it was responding, it couldn't really do math, as you might not be surprised, but it was responding to subtle body language cues from its trainer that were really unconscious, even to the trainer. And the analogy here is that some of these um, uh, natural language understanding benchmarks allow for subtle cues that aren't really related to understanding, but there are associations between patterns of words and a correct answer that the systems can take advantage of. A lot of people have been giving these large language models standardized tests, like um, the bar exam or um, SATs and other kinds of tests, but there you have to worry about possibility of data contamination, namely that some of those questions or similar questions might be actually be in the training data. And in some cases, like for the open AI models and Google large language models, we don't have access to the training data, so it's hard to know what's in there. And even more so, even if a system can perform very well on a test like that, it might not correlate well with real performance in the real world. So, you know, you've seen headlines like ChatGPT doing well on MBA exams or law school exams or medical licensing exams, but there you have to wonder to what extent these exams, these standardized exams will predict that, that are designed to predict something about human understanding can really predict things about machine understanding. And I wrote about this. And so also my um, other, uh, other AI experts, you know, wrote about how these are the wrong answer to the wrong question because, you know, you might have tested on the training data and human benchmarks are actually meaningless for what they call bots. <clears throat> Other people have said, okay, well, let's really the core of understanding is the ability to do abstraction, to abstract some kind of situation and apply it to new, um, new kinds of situations via analogy. And there's been a number of such uh, explorations, but then there's a question of how real or robust are these abstractions that they create. So, a lot of people have shown that, you know, large language models can perform mathematical reasoning and ar arithmetic. Um, but interestingly, in this paper over here, um, these researchers showed that strangely, the, <laughs> the, it would, the, these systems could make errors, do well on some, some numbers and make errors on others. And the um, accuracy, was very closely tied to the frequency of that number in pre-training data. So somehow the frequency of a number in a pre-training -tra pre was um, affecting the ability for the system to reason with it. So the reasoning was not 
robust mathematical reasoning, but really had to do with some kind of similarity to uh, things that it had seen in its training data. And this has been shown for other kinds of tasks. So in this paper, this recent group, um, this recent paper showed that in many kinds of reasoning tasks, um, if you give the, the system a, a version of the task that's similar to one that it's seen in its training data, the large language model here, GPT-4, will perform very well. But if you give it another version that's less likely to have been seen in its training data, its performance will decrease sometimes quite dramatically. So just one example of that is the code execution. So for example, GPT-4 is very good at executing a little snippet of code. And um, that's the performance shown in this blue line in Python code. But if they give it um, a, a slightly tweaked version of Python in which they call it ThonPy, which is identical, except all the variables use one based indexing, like in MATLAB and R, they ask, what is the same snippet of code print? So a human who's good at executing code in Python can reason about uh, what would happen if you, instead of having zero-based indexing, you had one-based indexing. But it turns out that this really reduces the ability of GPT-4 to succeed in this task. So it has a kind of brittleness that when it sees uh, kinds of reasoning tasks that are a little bit too far outside what it's been trained on. And this group, uh, this is another paper showing a very similar result that showed that many tasks, here we have a shift cipher where the goal is, you know, you've, you've shifted letters by a certain number in the alphabet, you know, so um, J is shifted by 13 letters to be W and so on. Um, GPT-4 is very, very good at this for uh, 13, but much, much worse for two. Why? Because it turns out that in internet text, this shift 13 is very common and the two, the shift by two is much less common. So it's somehow not figuring out any general reasoning ability here, but something much more specifically tied to its training data. And this was shown for many different tasks. So the take home message, large language models are much better on solving reasoning tasks that are similar to those seen in its training data, which raises the question of whether they're performing abstract reasoning or whether they're performing what some people have called pattern matching or approximate retrieval with examples in their training data. The same is somewhat true for humans. Humans are known to be better on reasoning that contains uh, on tasks that seem familiar to them, but not to the extent, they're not sort of biased to the same extent as language models. They're still much better at out of, out of distribution generalization and abstraction than machines. So evaluating these systems intelligence and understanding is tricky. I would say to understand their true capabilities, we need to know what's in the training data. That's hard to do for some of these closed commercial language models. You need to test systematically on variations of tasks, not just a single instance. You know, we've seen that if you do these kind of adversarial variations, um, these systems tend to fail much more, uh, much more frequently. So we have to test adversarially or counterfactually. And um, the, those kinds of things uh, are talked about in this paper, this really interesting paper by Francois Cholet, a uh, scientist at Google, who wrote about how to fairly compare the intelligence of computers and humans. This was in 2019, so it was before the explosion of generative AI. But Cholet proposed a really interesting task set of tasks that are not based on language, but instead are based on um, sort of very basic human concepts. He called it the abstraction and reasoning corpus. 
or arc. And here's an example of a task. So um, the, the domain is, is it, it is, are these uh, two-dimensional grids with colored uh, squares or pixels, if you like. And you're going to show uh, two or more demonstrations of a, of a transformation. So here's one demonstration, and here's another demonstration of the same underlying abstract transformation rule. And then you ask the solver to, to apply the same, to sort of infer the transformation rule and apply it to a new example. Okay, so this is something pretty easy for people to do. You know, they can get the rule pretty easily um, and apply it to many different cases. So this is sort of an idealization of this idea of abstraction, where you're trying to take, to abstract some um, general concept and apply it to new situations. And the, the idea is to test what are called core knowledge systems to, to have tasks that use the same kind of core knowledge that developmental psychologists have um, uncovered for the way that what sort of babies can reason about. That, you know, humans, the youngest humans can reason about things having to do with objects, space and geometry and shapes, numbers and small numerosity. Um, also, babies are able to reason about agents and their, their actions, sort of agency, things that have goals, things that don't. This this is not included in this current version of the ARC domain, but the top three are. So here's another example of a task. So you can see there's here three demonstrations. And what this test is sort of being able to identify types of shapes and color the types of shapes a certain color, even if the type of shape, you know, here, this shape, which is sort of an L shape, here it's rotated, um, here it's uh, rotated in an even different direction and different size. <clears throat> so these shapes, this is sort of shape invariance. And people are pretty good at these things. So Cholet created a thousand of these tasks. This is called a task, published 800, held out 200 as a hidden test set, and put this up on Kaggle which is a platform for machine learning challenges and uh, offered some prize money. In the end, there were about 900 teams. Each uh, team was given the, um, the 800 published tasks, and then they submitted a program for solving them that was tested on the 200 uh, hidden tasks. And they were each on each task, you get three guesses. And if one of your guesses is correct, um, it's the whole, you're considered to have solved the problem. So the winning program only got about 20% accuracy on the test set. I won't, I'll tell you if you're interested later on uh, how it worked. <clears throat> and um, the ensemble of the top two programs got about 31% accuracy, which is pretty low compared to what humans can do. Um, and that, this was done in 2020, but that's still the state of the art. This is a new competition that was held last year, offering even more money in Swiss francs. Um, and really nobody was able to exceed this, um, uh, this state of the art. So my colleagues and I um, developed a new benchmark in this domain, which we called concept arc. Uh, we saw a couple of problems with the original arc tasks. Many of them were too even too hard for humans, which I think was limiting AI systems on these. But more importantly, you know, they didn't, these tasks don't systematically test understanding of different concepts. So for example, if a pro program can solve this task, can we say that it has understanding of shapes and shape invariance? Well, no, it might have been using some kind of shortcut. So what, instead, of course, we say we have to systematically test with different variations. And that's exactly what we tried to do 
we created variations for 16 very basic concepts. Uh, for each concept, we varied the tasks in complexity and degree of abstraction. So here's here are the kind of concepts we used. So as an example, the concept um, top and bottom. Okay, so here are our demonstrations. It's a very simple version. So we tried to make them as simple as possible so that people would do well and then test machines. And so here you can see, you know, the, the, the task is to remove the bottom object. Okay, and we tested humans, uh, <clears throat> GPT-4 on a text-based version of these. And uh, the, the winning program from the Kaggle competition. All these got it correct. 100% of the humans we tested got it correct. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these systems all understand the concept of top and bottom. So we look at a new variation. So here's another variation where the rule is to color the top row of the object red. Again, every everybody got it correct. But then if we use another simple variation, remove the top and the bottom objects, now humans are still getting this 100% correct, but these programs are getting it incorrect. And we can um, show this is a, a, a different um, <clears throat> category. This is the, the sameness versus difference category. Here, the rule is keep the two objects that are the same. I mean, that, that, that keep the two or three or however num number objects that have the same shape. Humans, 100%. The Kaggle winning program got it correct. GPT-4 got it incorrect. Here's a new variation on the sameness. Again, keep the objects that have the same shape, um, even if they have different uh, colored borders. Humans got it 100%, programs got it incorrect. Here's another one where we're uh, getting rid of the two objects that have the same border color um, and inner color. Again, humans, well, here nine, nine out of 10 got it correct. Uh, we're using um, Amazon Mechanical Turk and prolific crowdsourcing platforms. So some of the humans are not trying too hard, but uh, more or less, everybody got it correct, but these programs got it wrong. And overall, if we look at human accuracy on these, each of these had had about um, uh, 50 different uh, problems associated with them. Humans are really good overall at these, but we see a much worse performance from these machines. Um, and we also tried the new version of GPT-4 Vision on some very easy tasks, uh, the, what we call minimal tasks, and you can see that it's doing even worse than the version of GPT-4 with language only. These are the easiest tasks. So overall, we do not find that these large language models have achieved the same kind of robust abstract reasoning abilities that humans have. So current work, we're looking at a system inspired by human visual reasoning to solve problems like these ARC problems, and also seeing how natural language can be used to scaffold new concept learning. So just to go back to this debate, which is sort of the first thing I started with. So this debate, you know, I've, I've sort of given some evidence that these systems don't really have the same kind of understanding of the world that humans do, that they sometimes are using shortcuts or um, using uh, sort of examples in their training data to reason and to understand. And if you give them out of distribution problems, they have trouble dealing with it. But what about the future as we um, improve these models, as we scale them up? Will their understanding improve? So we in that paper, we asked, all, Three key questions, which I'll end with here. First, is it that talking of understanding in these systems is really a category error? And this is what some people would say, you know, are we mistaking sort of associations between language tokens? 
for associations between those tokens and our, our own physical, social, or mental experience. Are these systems grounded in any way, or do they lack the kind of grounding you need for understanding? Well, that's one side of the debate. Another side of the debate says that these systems or their near-term successors may actually, even in the absence of physical experience, create something like the kinds of rich concept-based based mental models that are central to human understanding. It's just going to take more data and maybe bigger networks. So scaling these models will create ever better concepts. So these are two sort of opposing views. But there's sort of an in-between view, you know, that says if these systems don't create such concepts, could their sort of unimaginably large systems of statistical correlations produce abilities that are functionally equivalent to human understanding, that don't have the kinds of brittleness that today's models have? Or could they en enable new understanding that we humans are incapable of accessing? Well, I think these are still quite open questions, and they're what make today's, you know, the situation we're in today particularly interesting and kind of ripe for uh, sort of the science of these language models. So I'll stop there and say thank you for listening, and very happy to uh, answer questions and hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that wonderful talk. Uh, I do have some questions, but uh, I'm going to wait to see if other audience members have some questions. Perhaps perhaps they want to ask you. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Uh, what about doing adversarial testing where the computer tries to stump the human? Uh, has, have you seen any examples of that? No, I haven't, but has it, I, I'm not an expert in this. I was wondering if you'd seen anything like that. You mean trying so so trying to get a computer to um, fool a human? Yeah, like uh, adversarial training, if you would. <laughs> Usually, adversarial training is uh, getting the uh, having the human try to fool the computer. I, I I think a computer could easily stump a human. You know, saying you know multiply these two five digit numbers or something, but. Um, yeah, I haven't seen anything exactly like that. Thank you. Uh, Daniel has a question. Uh, yeah, so Melanie, thank you. Thank you for the excellent uh, talk. Um, now, you were talking also about concepts, and uh, concepts are a big part of mental representations. And arguably, this is a big part of how humans um understand the world and solve problems so wouldn't it be fair to say that large language models do develop some kind of mental representations starting with the uh embeddings that the mapping of the tokens and um, any kind of physical reality it could be images it could be sounds onto an internal abstract space so isn't that the at least the genesis of mental representations that at some point could evolve to the level of mental representations that humans use to understand the world? So th those are definitely mental representations, or you know, I don't know if you want to call them mental, but they're certainly representations and abstract representations. Uh, and they you know, they can be used for for some kinds of abstract reasoning. But I guess the question I'm asking is, are that, you know, can we get machines that aren't interacting physically in the world um, like we are to um, get the robustness of representations? You know, the that thing I started with the example with the school bus, Obviously, that thing had a that that neural network had an internal representation of the school bus, and it probably could recognize different school buses, uh, but it wasn't able to sort of deal with uh, variations in the way that humans can robustly. So that's really the key, and I don't know the answer. Can you know? There's a big argument about embodiment in AI and whether it's essential for understanding. And I don't know for sure. I think probably it is, but 
I think we'll see. <laughs> so uh, let me go next. So it's been uh, argued from, I would say, at least the 1980s onward that deductive chains of limited fixed length could be simulated by associative mechanisms like recursive neural networks. And I think probably chatbots are now a fairly good uh, evidence for that, which brings up the question that maybe um, the difference or a difference between humans and machines at this point is just the cap capacity constraints. You know, how long those chains can be, how strong, how many associations you can keep in your hippocampus at the same time. Would you care to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Um, you know, these systems in, in some sense don't have a hippocampus. <laughs> they, they, have, yeah. they have a context length window. And these context windows have gotten enormous, you know, like 32,000 tokens or whatever, which is much, you know, we humans can barely deal with five or six at a time or nine or 10. Well, things in our working memory. Yeah, so, so we're sort of forced to abstract more than I think these machines are forced to abstract. To, to what extent they can do deductive uh, logical reasoning is, it, you know, people have looked at that and there's some, you know, there's some benchmarks for it, which these, some of these systems have done reasonably well, but um, they still make a lot of errors. And the question is sort of, how, is, that a, is that just a capacity thing or is it something more fundamental? I don't think there's agreement on that yet. Sure, I'm asking your opinion. Yeah, I would say there's something more fundamental that's needed in, in being able to do these kinds of abstractions. And, you know, we, we've gotten these systems that can sort of simulate to some extent the kind of symbolic processes that people use when they're doing deduction, but um, they're not, they're, 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 they're far from perfect. And so I guess my opinion is that just scaling them up isn't going to solve the problem. Do you think there's evidence that any of them have created a new abstraction to solve any particular problem? <laughs> that's a great question you know um and sort of how if we could if we could understand better sort of how they solved a problem we would then be able to answer that question a little better but they are notoriously bad at explaining themselves so you know just as an example there was a, a the there was alpha go right which was able to play go better than any human and there was one match on which it came up with an extremely surprising move, right? That all the Go, I don't play Go, so I'm not an expert, but all the commentators were going like, that is an incredible move. How did it ever, no human would have come up with that. Was there an abstraction underlying that, that, you know, like humans have abstractions when they play these games? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't able to explain its reasoning. So it's not clear whether it was using just some massive amount of association or some abstraction that could be applied in a new situation. So, so, so there's also the theory about humans that uh, when we account for our reasoning, it's actually just a, a chunk of our brain that's constructing just those narratives to post-rationalize our behavior. Right. right. I mean, I think we do do that sometimes, but I, I think we're able to faithfully explain our reasoning at least some of the time not in <laughs> politics <laughs> perhaps <laughs> um, so uh, to push a little further on this do you think that there is a decision surface in some space that will reliably put most humans on one side and most machines on the other uh, by, by some space, I mean, you know, uh, some, some procedure right now, um, one that will durably be able to distinguish, <laughs> uh, it depends what, but what you mean by durably, you know, I mean, in, I mean, going forward in, in the infinite future, I don't know. 
and also you have to sort of define what you mean by machine because I I sort of think of ourselves as sort of very complex machines in a way. Well, all right. But, I mean, yeah. yeah, but is there some like Turing test that you're saying is that's going to... A Turing test is a particular decision yeah. surface, but not a particularly inspiring one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think for now, absolutely, there's many such decision surfaces for the far future. I don't know. That's... Possibly not. And, um, you know, the, the AI has always been characterized by a, a really severe bias towards whatever it make, whatever it is that makes AI researchers smarter than the general public must be a decisive characteristic mm -hmm. of intelligence. I mean, when we, when we consider sort of the, the great mass of humanity, uh, there are many things in which uh, these machines are already more competent or at least produce a convincing illusion of being more competent. Absolutely. I mean, that's been true for a lot of the history of AI. <laughs> way, way back to the first automatic checkers game. Yeah. But, you know, there's this notion that there's this thing called AGI, which is going to, which consists of what people call cognitive abilities that there's this way to separate sort of our cognitive abilities from all our other abilities. So we wouldn't expect, you know, chat GPT to go fix your plumbing leak, but somehow we're sort of separating that ability from the ability to, um, you know, write a legal brief or something like that. And I'm not so convinced that those abilities are so cleanly split off. So, you know, sure. <clears throat> Any of these machines can beat me at chess, but um, I still think there's going to be many tasks, if you will, that are going to require things that machines still are very quite far from accomplishing. Where do you think your concept, your corpus of concept testing questions falls in that? Yeah, I think they're pretty far away from being able to solve the, those kinds of things. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I have a few questions I've wanted to ask you for a while, and this is my chance. So, um, so I mean, I've read your earlier works like copycat, let's say, uh, or um, I feel like there's a difference between giving something a list of concepts and it can search through a list of concepts to uh, find an analogy versus uh, somehow forming those concepts in the first place. Do you see that distinction or is is it just, you just start off with some very, very primitive rules about, okay, straight lines and points and then everything else just builds off of that? Or... Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we have, we're, you know, we humans have some kind of inductive bias in that we're, bit, we're, we're born with certain propensities to learn certain kinds of concepts that are useful for our survival in general. Um, and that we then are, have capacity to learn new concepts that are based on our primitives. So I see that as key to the development of intelligence is that ability to take sort of the primitives that you have and to then extend them to new concepts. And I don't think we know, you know, we don't know how people do that. We don't know how to get machines to do that. So I think in, in that way, my, you know, my earlier work on analogy where you had a fixed repertoire of concepts was quite limited. Uh, and the other question is given, let's say, the an unreliability of these large models, uh, uh, maybe language models or some, you know, plus vision, like, uh, what do you think is the right way to use them. Uh, let's say not purely in the creative aspects of things, but you know some more uh, other useful uh, applications if there are. Do you see them as somehow combining the outputs with some actual planner or reasoning step or uh, that actually confirms whether things are right? In that case, do you see the outputs of the language model being useful? To somehow warm start these algorithms. How do there's you definitely, that? you know, there's definitely benefit in in using them 
interact with a human in the loop, or perhaps, as you say, some other kind of more, you know, trustworthy ver verification system in the loop. Um, there, there was a really interesting study I saw from Harvard Business School where they, they had like business consultants try and use these systems in different kinds of tasks. And for the tasks that involved sort of the human in the loop, the, the, the systems being sort of generators of ideas, humans being sort of the verification, they, they were extremely helpful for the consultants. But in the, ta in the tasks where they were asked to solve a pro some kind of reasoning problem themselves, they were they made the consultants be performance worse because the consultants were trusting them too much and they weren't trustworthy so uh there's you know trying to figure out what they what you can trust them to do autonomously and what you can't is still you know that's kind of well, yeah like that was my next question like are there any things you would trust them doing at this point like would you use the output of an llm and do something with it without a human in the loop or other verification at this point or is it completely unreliable that's a great question um i you know for the stuff that i use them for probably i wouldn't trust them like generating code which they're very good at uh but they're not they make mistakes um or or generating you know text summaries of things of papers or something like that you know they they are great at it but they do make mistakes and they can you know hallucinate and all of that so i i'm not sure what would i mean i'd be interested to hear what people think they're good for completely autonomously <laughs> and i guess one of maybe the last question is uh, maybe you've already answered it, but I'll ask again. Uh, are there any real world problems, maybe in vision or any other domain, you think have been solved or can be solved simply by scaling, either mm -hmm. with large uh, mo models or just more data? Oh, real world problems that, that you would that are solved by large language models or in AI in general? Uh, let's say like learning based, like statistical learning based methods. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sure there are, but I can't think of one off the end. <laughs> I mean, I'm just asking if there's some limits to just data driven learning itself that just cannot actually yeah. solve the complexity of the world in any I mean, you know, people haven't solved this adversarial attack problem. Right. Yeah. And yeah, and maybe perhaps it's uh, an inbuilt feature of such uh, such learning paradigms which you cannot really solve at all no matter how you know, how much data there is. Yeah. Um I think those are all the questions I had to ask you. Um Oh, I guess one other question is, I mean, have you thought about things like where you can combine those earlier symbolic methods with these neural methods for analogy making or, or you know, uh, uh, learning, uh, you know, for forming more abstractions and things like that? Or, or do you see other people doing things like this? Which are yeah, so there's this large area called neurosymbolic AI, which can mean a lot of different things. And I don't, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of, systems that we consider to be sort of neuro neuro based that actually use symbolic uh things that to help it like you know definitely in in self-driving cars or a combination of sort of uh, neuro based vision and and symbolic rules and all even in in like systems like AlphaGo, which do a kind of symbolic kind of tree search mm -hmm. in com combination with neural nets so yeah there's some interesting but but this still falls short in, in making those uh even analogy making for you know vanguard sure. problems or sure. assembling arc even yeah though it seems like they're very simple things <laughs> at least yeah. yeah yeah no it's a good question i don't know uh, yeah so those are all the things i had to ask you that i wanted to ask you for a long time and so okay. i'm very happy that i could do that and, Great. I think Matt, Matt has a question. Yeah, oh, I'm going to be picky with the last two minutes. Um, yeah. 
So, so you know, there's this actually an old argument in economics that creativity is basically theft plus variation. Mm -hmm. uh, and AI people would say, and the variation is subject to the constraint that you can't stray too far from the distribution of what's considered legitimate. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's some evolutionary process that throws away the, the variations that are too far. Um, and an excellent example of that is uh, number sequence completion in IQ tests, you know, what number comes next, one, two, four, eight, so on, uh, which can be completely brute forced by uh, matching to the Sloan integer sequence database, and then picking out the match that's accessed most often by mathematicians, which is usually a proxy for the one that the, has the simplest rule. Uh, so I'm wondering the particular test that you constructed with the uh, uh, the three three examples and then apply to an and 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 then the notion that you say that we're going to have a library of concepts and we want to find the concept that explains this and apply it couldn't that be brute forced in the same way with you know some spatial predicates uh it's possible but i'm i haven't you know the the, the kaggle competition winners were sort of trying to do that, trying to brute force it in that way, but did not succeed. And I think the variation is enough that um, it's going to be really hard to brute force it. Then you're doing research, so you have some notion about what something that's better than brute force? Well, I don't think humans brute force it. So I'd like to get be inspired by how humans solve these kinds of problems. And can we get a sneak preview of what the <laughs> hypothesis is, or do we have to wait for well, the, the you movie? Know, that kind of uh, related to my earlier work on analogy making that used ideas from active perception and integrating perception and conceptual conceptual reasoning. But yeah, definitely work in progress. Okay, I guess I'm going to wait for the paper. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. If there are no questions. Uh, we've also reached the end of you know uh, Melanie's time here. So I want to thank Melanie again for taking the time to uh, tell us about uh, uh, you know, her work on uh, these large models. You know, trying to understand what they understand. You know, the right ways to use them and test them. So uh, thank you again. Uh, I hope to run into you in the real world and in, in some conference at some point. Um, uh, yeah, with that, let's end the talk. Uh, thank you again for- Thank you. Tomorrow. Thanks very much. It's been fun. Thanks for the great questions. Thank you.